It's that metallic stuff that glistens in the sun with an unrivaled, brilliant reflection. If there's no chrome in heaven, I'm not going. But don't let its flashy facade fool you. It also protects steel, stops corrosion, and transforms plastic. Whether restoring a classic or tricking out a truck, this metal shines above the rest. Girls like diamonds, guys like chrome. From the gleaming top of the Chrysler building to life-sized sparkling stallions. Now, Chrome on Modern Marvels. Chrome. Even the word sounds lustrous. For some, it's a subtle detail. For others, a bold statement. But for hot rod enthusiast Mike Hera, chrome is pretty much everything. I don't think you can have enough chrome on a car. I think the chrome is the whole part of the car. This is a 1943 Packard. Dash 5, 2500 flyer. Probably 80% of the car is chrome. The very front is my favorite part of the car. It's a, out of a, a tractor trailer. It's a drop front end. It's all chrome plated. The calipers are chrome plated. The disc brakes are plated. The front end, the drag links, the headlights. It's probably the most dramatic part of the car. Only the 30 foot long body of the 16,000 pound metal roadster lacks the true luster of chrome. The car itself is all aluminum, and then we polished it out to make it look like chrome, because chrome has to be put into tanks, and then it's electroplated. So they don't make tanks large enough to put the whole car in. If we could get it in the tanks, we would have plated it. Amazingly, there's not really much chrome on the car. The chrome plating on the parts is just millions of an inch thick. But more on that later. Perhaps the most dazzling part of the chrome mobile is its fire-breathing engine. The engine was originally out of a 1943 PT boat. And we converted it and built this entire car around it. And it's the ultimate chrome machine. It puts out uh, 3,000 horsepower, and it's uh, 2,500 cubic inches. The fast we've had is about 125. Still had a lot of power. It was still climbing. We were just not sure we could stop it. <laughs> Mike spent more than a million dollars custom building the gleaming chrome beast. I think it's everything. I think it adds luster, you know, a mystery to the car. It just makes the car. So just what is this mysterious gleaming substance we call chrome? Chrome is short for chromium, which is a highly reflective metal resistant to tarnish and corrosion. That's because upon contact with the atmosphere, the metal develops a protective oxide coating. It's just like iron rust, but clear. Perhaps nobody depends on chrome's corrosion resistance and bright sheen more than truckers. Everybody wants to have a cool looking truck. We have a lot of time to think driving down the road of stuff to add and do to your truck, so you know, it's, it's endless. If we didn't have chrome, you know, all the truck drivers would be lost. We, we wouldn't have nothing to cover up all this stuff. At four state trucks in Joplin, Missouri, tens of thousands of truckers make their way to this treasure trove of chrome. It's the home of the self-proclaimed Chrome Shop Mafia. Truckers go 40, 50, sometimes 100 miles out of route to come by here, visit the store, and get their chrome fix. Whether it's a little gadget they want for their dash, you know, a nice shiny front bumper, or even these big exhaust pipes we sell in stock. They've got to have their chrome. They're addicted to chrome sometimes. For truckers looking to add some serious bling to their big rigs, the Chrome Shop Mafia knows all the tricks. At their on-site installation room, this 2007 Peterbilt 379 is in the middle of an extreme chrome makeover. We're almost done chroming it out. We have a few finishing touches to put on it yet, such as a chrome-plated 22 to a 20 tapered bumper, an exhaust stack, some chrome-plated plastic hub covers, a chrome spot mirror on the mirrors up here by the door, 
and just various little knick-knacky stuff inside. Swapping out the bumper and adding minor chrome accents takes little more than a few nuts and bolts. But attaching the nine foot tall, 100 pound chrome exhaust stack requires some real elbow grease. We made our own T-pipe. It's 10 inches as well as the pipe is, and we're trying to slide this pipe into our T-pipe. It's not the easiest thing in the world to maneuver because it's so big and awkward and heavy, but it fills up this entire gap so you don't have any open cavities on your truck. So. It's well worth it in the end. Of course, there's always a cheaper alternative to chrome, but that means sacrificing the unique glint of the metal. On these big rigs, there's a lot of chrome on it, but there's also a lot of stainless steel, and from a distance, they're all shiny. They're all somewhat reflective. But here's something for comparison. This is just a raw piece of stainless steel, and we can take the yardstick, kind of hold it up there and look into it like a mirror, you can see the image there, but it's a little foggy, a little blurry. Now take a look at the chrome plated finish down here on this bumper. I mean, look at that. You can read every number right down to the hash marks, you know? That's a true mirror image. That's a good thing about chrome plating. But chrome's origins are not so flashy. The metal can be traced back to late third century BC Chinese weapons. Although buried more than 2,000 years ago, Ancient bronze tips of swords found at the Terracotta Army burial pits showed no sign of corrosion. Scientists discovered the ancient weapon makers unknowingly created a bronze that contained 2% chromium. Probably fires in the mausoleum caused the chromium to migrate to the surface of the swords. But it wasn't until 1797 that French chemist Nicolas Louis Bacalin first discovered the lustrous metal in a red lead ore from Siberia. He named it chromium, after the Greek word chroma, meaning color, since many of its compounds produce vibrant colors. And for more than a century, chromium's primary use was in paints and dyes. It wasn't until the early 1900s that metallurgists discovered chrome's corrosion resistance in the production of steel. Chromium is very important in the manufacturing of stainless steel. If it wasn't for the addition of chrome, stainless steel would no longer be stain resistant. Today, metal alloys account for 85% of chromium use. Almost 50% of the primary commercial ore, called chromite, is produced in South Africa. The ore is also abundant in India, Russia, Kazakhstan, and Turkey. In 2008, world production of chromium reached 15 million tons. That's $2.5 billion worth. The flashiest use of chrome is plating it onto other metals. In fact, objects are never made of solid chrome, but rather covered in a thin layer of the metal. So why not make a solid chrome bumper? Ultimately, it wouldn't be any shinier or more durable, but would add unnecessary weight and more than double the price. At the Arlington Plating Company in Palatine, Illinois, 50 technicians chrome plate more than 15,000 aluminum and magnesium parts each week. To get the chrome to stick to the parts, technicians turn to electroplating. It's the process of coating an electrically conductive object with a layer of metal using direct current. For most metals, the process is pretty much the same. We run the current off a rectifier. What the rectifier will do, the rectifier will take AC current and transform it to DC current, like a giant battery, a car battery or such. You have your positive hooked up to both sides here, which is your anode. Your cathode or your part itself is the negative. The hanging baskets on each positively charged side contain the metal to be plated to the part. The 2,500 gallon tank is filled with an acidic solution that permits the flow of electricity. Since the part itself is negatively charged, it attracts the positively charged metal from the baskets. But creating a chrome shiny finish isn't just a quick dip. In their large scale electroplating line, 
Truck bumpers and step tubes traveled back and forth for more than three hours between 28 tanks. The process begins with a 30-minute pretreatment of several hot cleaners and a nitric acid blend to ensure the purest and smoothest aluminum surface. And before the bumper can get its flashy coat of chrome, it goes through four tanks of nickel for more than two hours. If I was just to put the chrome on there, it would not look shiny and beautiful and bright like everybody thinks chrome is. When we pull it out after the nickel tank, it looks yellow. And if you put it out on a vehicle, it'll tarnish very quickly. The chrome gives it that nice blue depth to it. And it allows, obviously, for it to last quite some time out in the field. While the aluminum bumper is just over an eighth of an inch thick, the nickel layer is only 15 ten thousandths of an inch thick. And the outer chrome layer is just 15 millionths of an inch thick. That's more than 250 times thinner than a human hair. Even so, it adds a sparkle and the utmost resistance to corrosion. To test this resistance, Arlington Plating Company technicians turn to a salt spray chamber. Placing parts in the chamber for just eight hours simulates more than two years of real life use. This is an unplated part, just raw steel part. As you can see, it rusted, the iron rusted, forming an iron oxide. This is a nickel plated part, slight rusting, a little bit of yellow. And then we have the chrome plated parts. As you can see, virtually flawless finish, no visible rusting at all. Chrome actually does rust like all other metals, but at a much slower rate. And unlike the eyesore of iron oxide, chrome oxide is clear. Back at the chrome plating line, the part finally makes its way to the chrome tank, which requires a unique electroplating technique. We're here at a final step, which is the actual chrome process itself. The chrome here is actually in the solution. There are no chrome anodes. We use lead anodes to give us the conductivity and the throw we need to place the chrome on the part. Finally, after just one minute in the chrome tank and then a few dunks in water to rinse off the golden chrome solution, this truck bumper is ready to hit the road. But not all chrome plating is so shiny and decorative. Hard chrome plating is applied directly to an object to create a thicker, more protective outer layer. While the chrome is still metallic, it's not very reflective since there's no nickel substrate. The hard chrome is used more in functional coating for wear, for lubricity, for hardness. Now, the part in hard chrome could be in a chrome tank actually for as long as hours. In Arlington plating, motorcycle pistons spend 10 minutes in the chrome tank, creating a layer of metal that is 500 times thicker than the chrome on decorative parts. Of course, most bikers aren't satisfied with just the duller, hard chrome parts. They want the shiny stuff, too. At Orange County Harley-Davidson in Southern California, bikers gather for a ride almost every weekend to show off their flashy choppers. I've always said to my friends is that if there's no chrome in heaven, I'm not going. I love to chrome things, I, and, and I love to customize it and make my bike unique to me. Well, this is a ultra classic, full dresser, bagger, they call them. I put chrome legs, I put chrome wheels, I changed the calipers, I changed the brake this, all chrome. So when it's rolling, it's shining. <laughs> it just glitters no matter what you do. It's just like a ring. Girls like diamonds, guys like chrome. <laughs> Motorcycles and modern big rigs may carry on chrome's glistening legacy, but it was tail fins and grills that first brought the shiny metal into the limelight, peaking with a decked out 1958 classic. For more than a century, chromium has captivated us as one of the most luminous metals found on Earth. Sure, it's all over big rigs and motorcycles, 
But when it comes to chrome flash, nothing beats the shiny display of eye candy at a classic car show. This is a 1953 Cadillac Coupe de Ville. It has quite a large amount of chrome on it. It's just a wonderful car to own. It attracts a lot of attention. In Santa Ana, California, more than 200 car enthusiasts gather each month to pay homage to the golden, or should we say, silver age of chrome. It uh, actually started in 1926 was the first car. It was a 1926 Oldsmobile, and it became a marketing tool in the designer's features because originally they had brass, they had um, copper. Well, all of that would tarnish and would tarnish very quickly. Soon, automakers used the metal to adorn everything from the front bumper to the taillights. The superior corrosion resistance and unmatched polish of chrome caught on with consumers. By the 1950s, chrome, virtually unknown 30 years earlier, had become a household word and a standard in car design. Case in point, this 1954 Packard Caribbean. At the time they designed this car, what they were looking for is sales, and the chrome basically sold the car. If you removed all the chrome and painted all this, it would actually have not probably resulted in a lot of sales. The use of this aptly named Brightwork peaked in 1958 with the Oldsmobile 98 sedan, believed to have more chrome per square inch than any other car from the decade. While grinning wide-mouthed grills and soaring tail fins may dazzle with their bold sparkle, perhaps the most intricate and unique chrome piece on a classic car is the hood ornament, or mascot, as collectors call them. At the American Aero Corporation near Detroit, Michigan, classic car collector and restoration expert Don Summer preserves more than 3,000 sparkling chrome mascots. Here's a pretty one. This is a new old stock 3031 Cadillac Heron. But another really pretty one is this Packard Adonis, sometimes called a sliding boy. This particular cap came out in 29 and they used it up through 31 and then a limited a little bit from 32 to 36. Some mascots were rigged to do more than just glisten in the sun. Well, this is, this is the action twins. And there, was a, there were a number of ornaments that, that operated with the wind, and this is one of them. And so as the car moved forward through the wind, it turned a propeller, and that made the figures move. Most of the miniature chrome sculptures in Summer's collection are worth a few hundred dollars apiece. Others are so unique, they're valued in the thousands. The most rare mascot that I have out here on the table is this boat. This is the only one known in the world. Looks like sort of a takeoff of a PT boat. And another rare one here is this Packard radio antenna. Um, very few of these exist. And this particular one is set up to be used on a 3940 Packard. And that was an actual antenna. I think I paid 2,500 at the time for it. That was probably 25 years ago. Mascots weren't always so shiny and ornate. In fact, they began as functional temperature meters mounted to the radiator caps on the front of cars. Here's an example of one that was on a Cleveland car. And these are called motor meters. And, and they, and they uh, told you what the temperature was in the radiator. When automakers moved the temperature gauge to the dash in the late 1920s, they replaced the motor meter with ornaments to cover up the humble radiator cap. And it became the mark of the car and so they started to have a contest to see who could get the prettiest one. By the 1930s, elaborate chrome-plated hood ornaments were standard. It wasn't until 1958 that automakers started removing the chrome accents, since they posed a higher risk for injuries and collisions with pedestrians. Beyond collecting the chrome figurines, Summer also has been creating and selling replicas of them for more than 40 years. Out of the 230 chrome mascots he offers, the Pierce Arrow Archer shines above the rest. I make it in two pieces, the cap and the ornament separate. When it gets all done, it's about $800 for the combination. To recreate the chrome archer, 
Summer utilizes the lost wax method. It starts at his shop with a meticulously shaped wax mold. From there, the mold heads to a foundry, where it's cast in stucco. It was developed in ancient times for statuary, but it's a way you can make some very complicated castings. And when you say lost wax, it's a process by which you lose the wax. After melting the wax out, workers pour molten stainless steel into the stucco shell. Once cooled down and knocked from its shell, the stainless steel mascot is polished and then moves on to a local chrome plating shop. Their workers flash plate it for just 15 seconds in chrome to give it that desirable sheen. The optimistic age of fins and chrome was cut short by the oil crisis of the 1970s. New emission regulations and fuel economy restrictions forced automakers to change their designs. And the heavy steel with chrome plating was kicked to the curb. Plastic took its place. But thanks to new electroplating technology, chrome is making a comeback in the form of plastic. Much like cars in the past that used a lot of decorative metal parts, vehicles today have a lot of plastic components that are chrome plated on them. Starting out with this vehicle, we have a chrome plated plastic grill. Along with the grill, we have emblems or name plates, as they're called, the skull cap on the mirror, door handles, as well as the body side moldings. The 450,000 square foot SRG Global Plastic Chrome Plating Facility in Moorhead, Kentucky, chromes as many as 15,000 plastic parts every day. Behind me is an injection molding machine one of 28 we have here in the plant. This particular machine is molding a grill. The process starts with the bulk material. The bulk material is fed into the barrel of the machine. The barrel melts the material from bulk form into a molten form. When it's in a molten form, it gets shot or injected into the molding tool you see behind us. Not only is chrome plating plastic more cost effective than using a steel substrate, but it's also lighter and ultimately more fuel efficient. Before the molded parts can get chrome plated, they must undergo an acid etching process so that the surface of the plastic behaves like a metal. We're at the beginning part of the process here, which is called the etching phase. At this part of the process is where we use a blend of chromic acid, sulfuric acid, along with heat to create porosity onto the surface of the part. The acid solution eats away at the plastic for about 10 minutes, creating microscopic craters on the part. Next, the sponge-like surface absorbs palladium to make up for plastic's inherently low static electric charge. The palladium deposits ultimately allow a chemical reaction to occur with nickel. The bath that we're in right now is called the electrolysis nickel bath. In this part of the process, the nickel now begins to react with that palladium and begins to deposit in those small little crevices and then grows out along the surface of the part. And now it begins to encapsulate it at about 10 to 12 millionths of an inch. Finally, the part is ready for its plunge into the chrome electroplating tank. The end result? A lightweight alternative to metal that's just as brilliant and it's used on more than seven million cars each year. While lustrous chrome may continue to rule the road, the metal surrounds you even more at home. It may not be as flashy, but odds are you couldn't go even one day without it. Our houses are loaded with chrome. But chrome-plated fixtures are just a small portion of the chrome in our homes. The metal's real dominance comes because of its ability to make steel stainless. In fact, almost 70% of all chrome is used in the production of stainless steel. And every year, the world demands about 27 million tons of stainless steel for cookware, cutlery, hardware, and major appliances. At North American Stainless in Gent, Kentucky, more than 3,000 tons of the shiny steel is manufactured each day. 
The process starts with the charging of scrap into the charging baskets. North American Stainless is probably one of the biggest recyclers of scrap in the United States. Every year we process about 780,000 tons of, uh, of stainless scrap to manufacture a finished product. To boost the chrome level, workers turn to ferrochrome, an alloy of chrome and iron that contains between 45 and 65 percent chrome. It's added to the scrap to achieve at least 10.5 percent chromium content. Anything lower than that and the resulting metal would not be stainless steel. Though it may not look the part, adding just two tons of this granular chrome mixture to each 150 ton batch of scrap ultimately adds luster and corrosion resistance to the steel. Once collected, an overhead crane dumps the raw materials into a massive furnace. We use an electric arc furnace. We have two electric arc furnaces. The uh, transformer size for one of those furnaces is probably 132 megawatts. Uh, a transformer of that size would light the downtown area of Louisville. After reaching a temperature of 2,200 degrees Fahrenheit in 45 minutes, now molten metal heads to a refining vessel. We'll be blowing argon and oxygen into the bottom of the vessel to remove uh, impurities in the steel, carbon, and sulfur. We'll stop midpoint and take a test sample from the vessel, and we'll be at that point checking the chrome content. If the uh, chrome content is not as we want, we have an overhead alloy system where we add further chrome. While stainless steel may have as little as 10.5% chromium, this particular mixture destined for flatware production requires 18% chrome. The higher percentage of chromium is essential for the flatware to withstand a house full of corrosive agents. Many of the household items that we take for granted are caustic, and they eat into steel. In this experiment, we took common household items such as vinegar, and we applied it to one sample, which was stainless steel, and the other, a low carbon steel. What we're doing is we're going to remove the vinegar from here. But as we remove it, we can see that there's no rust. In this, the low carbon steel, as we remove the vinegar, there's a different story. Because of the lack of chrome, we see the corrosion process begin. From wine, to soda, to bleach, the results are all the same. They never make stainless steel with more than 20% chrome because it doesn't add much more corrosion resistance, but significantly increases the cost. Once the molten steel reaches the specified chrome concentration, it's molded and then cut by 4,000 degree Fahrenheit torch flames into 35 ton, 43 foot long semi-finished forms called slabs. They're brought to the hot mill furnace, which is behind me here. At that point in time, they are placed into the furnace and they're in the furnace approximately two and a half hours to reheat those slabs to around 2,320 degrees Fahrenheit to reduce their strength so we're able to hot roll the product The hot mill uses two rollers to compress the 43-foot-long, 8-inch-thick slab to a 2,000-foot-long coil, just under a fifth of an inch thick. Next, the new stainless steel undergoes a treatment called annealing. The steel is heated and cooled to relieve internal stresses and make the metal less brittle. After that, an acid treatment called pickling removes any surface contaminants. Finally, the stainless steel is cleaned, polished, and cut to length before heading to fabricators across the country. Flatware made from stainless steel coils is a billion dollar industry. At Sherrill Manufacturing in Sherrill, New York, the coils become more than 50,000 forks, spoons, and knives every day. Though it's the only flatware manufacturer left in the United States, 
It's one of the most technologically sophisticated in the world. Any flatware you see that has USA on the back stamp, it was made in this factory. We have a lot of automated equipment that allows us to use a lot less labor per piece. If this factory was running at full capacity, we could do about 400,000 pieces in a day. To make a fork, Cheryl typically uses 18-8 stainless steel. That means the steel contains 18% chrome and 8% nickel. The nickel increases the corrosion resistance. It also makes the part easier to manufacture. It's softer. It doesn't harden as fast. When you have 18% chrome and no nickel, the part becomes very brittle. The manufacturing process starts by feeding a 650-foot long stainless steel coil through a 150-ton blanking press. This is the piece that comes out. It's a fork blank. The thickness of the material is 105 thousandths of an inch. From this coil, we can get about 16,000 forks. We'll go through about three of these coils a day, which is 7,500 pounds. After the press, the flat forks continue on to get their tines, or prongs. To prevent the resulting prongs from bending, a so-called tine bar holds them together. Then we'll go into a stamping process where we put the pattern into the handle, and then the machine next to that will put the bowl on it. We strike the handle and raise the bowl in a coining press. It's very similar to making a coin, only a lot slower. Those pieces run about 5,000 pieces an hour. Once shaped, machines remove the time bar and delicately buff the prongs. Then the forks pass through an eight-step buffing and polishing machine. After the pieces are buffed, they come to this machine here behind me, which is an ultrasonic wash. It uses detergent and ultrasonic waves to clean them. And then they're able to go into a bag nice and clean for the customer. So our homes are filled with chrome, sometimes by the bag full. Office buildings use chrome, too. Consider the Chrysler building, but it's chrome is far from ordinary. The Chrysler Building. Thanks to Chrome, the eight-decade-old building is one of the most recognized skyscrapers in the world. The Chrome gives it that brilliance, the shininess, and that is one of the most extraordinary things about the top of the Chrysler Building. On a day like today, with the sun shining, it glints off of the metal, and it looks just stunning. In fact, the special stainless steel that glistens in the New York sun contains 18% chrome. And it was actually selected by Walter Chrysler himself for its performance characteristics and that it looked a lot like the chrome used on cars. He had it tested at his laboratories in Michigan and found that it was going to perform very well. The automobile tycoon chose the so-called Nyrosta metal due to the fact that it didn't rust and never had to be cleaned or polished to maintain its luster. Created in the 1920s by Krupp Metalwork of Germany, Nyrosta was the first stainless steel used in a major architectural project. The use of this chrome-heavy metal, along with the sleek and modern design of the dome and spire, was very characteristic of the Art Deco design movement of the time. This was a period, you know, the, the whole idea of we're in the modern world. Um, let's have modern styles. Uh, let's have forward-looking things. Art Deco takes its name from a design exposition held in Paris in 1925. American consumers found the geometric style and metallic materials elegant and functional. Soon designers were using chrome on everything, from furniture to toasters. And today, the Chrysler Building remains the most famous Art Deco skyscraper. Those receding circles rising up with the uh, triangular windows and merging into that 185-foot spire rising into the sky, you can't miss it. Add to that all of the decorative features, the metal, it's got all of the geometric effects. There's just nothing quite like it. It is the Art Deco skyscraper. Construction started in 1928 and took just 18 months. In a shop set up inside the building, 
metal workers measured and cut the nyrosta. Then roofers attached and joined the shiny metal together piece by piece to create the entire facade above the 61st floor. It was all custom, hand-fabricated work. Even the famous pineapples, radiator caps, and eagles were fashioned by hand from nyrosta and then attached to iron frames protruding from the building. He's all right. he can't fly off of it. These are what we called the flying radiator caps, or wings of mercury, but it's basically a replica of the 1929 radiator cap from a Chrysler. Looking at this piece, it probably came as, as a hemisphere on that disc, a hemisphere on this disc. This would have been a separate piece. Then that crowning element may have been the last part. The automobile iconography is throughout the building. But here, especially on the 31st floor, it's really apparent. You start with a radiator cap at much larger scale. And then down over on the wall here, you can see there's a replication of the wheels and the hubcaps from a Chrysler. So they're much larger than they are on the car. But they're integrated into the architecture in a very creative and, frankly, fun way. Stainless steel also cloaks the 185-foot vertex. But the sparkling needle piercing the sky wasn't always part of Chrysler's design. In fact, the structure was added solely to make the skyscraper taller. That enormous piece of steel that you see rising at the very top was brought to the building secretly in five pieces, welded together in the dark of night. And then as dawn broke, it rose with a winch right up through the top, bringing the height of the building to 1,046 feet and claiming the title of world's tallest building, which it held for almost 18 months because then the Empire State Building opened and that was the end of that. In all, 40 tons of Nyrosta metal, containing more than seven tons of chrome, was used throughout the skyscraper. And the sparkling metal has certainly held up over time. Since the Chrysler Building opened its doors on May 27, 1930, the chrome spire, dome, and adornments have only been cleaned twice. Eight decades later, chrome is still making a statement in the world of architecture. Designers have once again turned to Nyrosta stainless steel for the construction of the Burj Dubai. Today, the Burj Dubai, which is slated to be the world's tallest building at over 2,500 feet tall, will be using stainless steel for window frames, spandrel panels, which is the blank wall below a window, and also will be used as window washing track. The facade of the unparalleled skyscraper will contain more than 400 tons of stainless steel. That's 10 times more Nyrosta than the Chrysler building. Even so, New York's brilliant icon won't lose its fans. It's so high up in the air that the sun is always reflecting off of it. And no matter where you are in the city, you can see the Chrysler building, and its gleam is always there. If you think the chrome eagles on the Chrysler building are eye-catching, how about a life-sized chrome horse sculpture on your front lawn? This guy knows where to go to get the materials. In Denver, Colorado, Sean Guerrero is hard at work on his latest masterpiece. When completed, it'll be a life-sized horse made entirely of recycled chrome bumpers. I'm not the only one who has built these sculptures from the medium. This is just my way of doing it. But the chrome definitely gives it some kind of rustic elegance. Guerrero has created more than 35 chrome sculptures, ranging from cowboys to giant roosters to dragons. Eagles and horses are his most popular pieces. This was my very first horse that I did probably 30 years ago. And now that I look at it, I remember at the time I had no idea how I was going to even build a horse. The work that I've done since then has really evolved. This piece here is kind of like a landmark. It's funny for me to see it up so close again after all this time. Today, the original chrome stallion is proudly displayed at Denver Bumper, the scrapyard where Guerrero got started. I just remember all the times that I used to 
come down here and I was like a kid. I was just kind of mesmerized by all this chrome, especially in the summertime. It's very bright and you see it all just shining. It's brilliant. The endless gleaming rose may look like a bumper graveyard to the layman, but to Guerrero, it's chrome heaven. When I'm looking around for a certain type of piece, usually it's something like this. I've got a big mass of metal right in here that I know when I bring it back to the shop, I can actually cut up. Like this section here might form part of the neck on a horse. Let's say, for example, I'm building some legs for an animal. Well, then I would look more for something like, like this here. I think this might be off of a Mustang. But these here, uh, with these curves, are more natural, kind of akin to the way uh, muscle structure on a uh, horse might be. Sometimes Guerrero knows exactly what he's looking for. Other times, the chrome bumpers give him inspiration. These here, what gave me my first idea when I built a knight on a horse. And when I was looking at this particular shape here, it reminded me of the helmet on a knight. If you could imagine the back part here coming around and then some sort of face plate in here with a head plume coming up, that's what I saw. This is one of the newer bumpers that I picked up over there at the yard. And I'm going to cut some pieces out of this uh, for certain areas that I need on the horse that I'm working on inside. So normally, I just kind of sketch something out with this soapstone here, just to give me something to follow. This is the device that I use to cut. It's, a, it's called a plasma machine. And what it basically does is it provides an electrical arc. The plasma cutting machine creates a clean and very precise cut. And it takes just a few minutes to chop up an entire bumper. Then Guerrero welds the pieces into place, each one bringing the chrome statue one step closer to its finished form. They may start as junk, but the finished sculpture has cost as much as $70,000. The way I see it, when I was a little kid, I remember always liking things like the chrome fenders on the Schwinn Stingray. That, for me, had an appeal. And I think it's human nature. We enjoy those types of things, even to this day, whether it's a shiny, nice, fresh painted house, a brand new Mercedes Benz, a diamond ring. We, as humans, are attracted to those objects. It's just something that's very deep rooted within our, our psyche. Maybe that's what's behind Chrome's appeal. Whether it's on sculptures or buildings, trucks or motorcycles, it's the metal that raises our spirits and mirrors our desires.